This is the chapter five pre-class lecture part one. Chapter five focuses on water. The learning objectives associated with chapter five include understanding the unique properties of water, knowing where water is located on the earth, which is important to ourselves, humans, as well as other life forms. And it's important where that water is located because that directly affects how and how much humans and other life forms use water. And then we're going to focus on how water interacts with other chemicals, specifically acids and bases. And then how do the properties of water? Well, first of all, what are the pro main properties of water? And then how do these properties of water change when water interacts with other chemicals and components? And so there are some essential facts noted here about water, which shows how important water is for life. Water also has very unique properties. We already know a lot of things about water. We know the molecular formula for water, H2O. Water is a molecular compound. It consists of only none metals. And we also know that at room temperature, water is a liquid. Water has a very high boiling point of 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. And also another thing that's unique about water, when it freezes, it actually expands. Most other liquids, when they freeze, they contract or get smaller. But water, when it freezes, it actually expands. We also know how to draw the Lewis structure for water. And in doing so, we've learned lots of things about water, such as its electronic geometry or electron geometry, as well as its molecular geometry or shape. The bond angle in water that exists between that central oxygen and the peripheral hydrogens. And then also, we've also talked about the fact that these two OH bonds that exist in the water molecule, that these are polar bonds. And the reason why it's a polar bond, because there is a difference in the electronegativities between the oxygen and the hydrogen that makes up the OH bond. And because there is a difference in electronegativity, with oxygen being more electronegative than hydrogen, oxygen is going to pull more of the electron density that's in this single OH bond towards itself. And then the hydrogen will have very little of the electron density towards it. And therefore that makes a polar bond. Whenever the two atoms that are bonded together are different atoms, with one atom being significantly more electronegative than the other, then the molecular bond, which we also call a covalent bond, we can classify it even more specifically as a polar covalent bond. So whenever there is a polar covalent bond, like with the OH bond in water, that means that the electrons are not shared equally. The more electronegative atom is gonna pull more of that electron density towards itself. And so with one atom pulling more of the electron density towards itself, that creates what we call a dipole, which we represent as an arrow. 
So for the water molecule, we can draw the dipoles for each OH bond represented as an arrow with the tip of the arrow always pointing towards the more electronegative atom. In this case, the oxygen atom. So those are our two individual dipoles. They are of the same magnitude. They have the same numerical value. Each dipole has a certain numerical value associated with it, which is related to the strength of the dipole. The greater the, the more electro, uh, the greater the electronegativity of the more electronegative atom, then the stronger the dipole. These are both OH bond dipoles. But they're going in opposite directions. And so therefore, because they are the same magnitude but going in the opposite direction, they do not cancel each other out. But instead, they add together. So they are additive and yield an overall dipole. So this is our overall dipole, which is the sum of the two red individual dipoles. So when we draw dipoles, we always place the arrow going towards the more electronegative atom. And then we like put a little line on the other end, which represents kind of like a plus sign. So another way we could represent these dipoles for water is with plus and negative signs, along with the Greek letter delta which means partial. The hydrogens are the least electronegative atoms in the OH bonds. So therefore they'll have a partial plus sign. The oxygen, being the more electronegative atom in the bond, will carry a partial negative sign. So that's what that dipole does. With the more electronegative atom pulling more of the electron density in the bond towards itself, it will therefore carry a partial negative charge. The least electronegative atom will carry a partial positive charge. And so we've seen our electronegativity trend. As you go from left to right across the periodic table, you get increasing electronegativity. And as you go from the top, from the bottom to the top, you also have increasing electronegativity, which I'll abbreviate EN. Then going from the top to the bottom, of course, is the opposite. That's decreasing electronegativity. And this little periodic table here is also a cool one to, uh, to have a copy of because it actually gives you the numerical electronegativity values for all the main group elements, as well as the transition metals. Fluorine 
is the most electronegative atom of them all. It has an electronegativity of four. That's the highest electronegativity that any element on the periodic table has. All other electronegativities for the other elements are going to be less than four. So fluorine is the most electronegative element. So for our OH bond in water, you got your partial negative charge on the oxygen, the partial positive charge on the hydrogen, because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Oxygen's electronegativity is 3.5. Hydrogen is 2.1. So therefore, we can calculate what we call the difference in electronegativity which is usually in most textbooks symbolized as a triangle, meaning change or different or difference. So we can calculate the delta EN as the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms. So the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen is 3.5 minus 2.4. And so that makes the OH bond polar covalent. So there, for if the difference in electronegativity is between 0.4 and 1.8, then you have a polar covalent bond. If the difference in electronegativity is less than 0.4, then you have what's called a pure covalent bond. A pure covalent bond is also called a nonpolar covalent bond. And then the last category, if the difference in electronegativity is greater than 1.8, then you're dealing with an ionic bond. So this is also a helpful little table here. The difference between elect a negativity between the atoms is zero. Then you're dealing with pure covalent, which is also called nonpolar covalent. If the difference uh, in electronegativity is intermediate, then it's polar covalent. If the difference in electronegativity is large, then you're dealing with an ionic bond. And then these are the exact numerical values that are associated with each category. And so now the topic of molecular polarity if you have a polar covalent bond in your molecule, then the molecule itself may or may not be polar. Whether or not the molecule is polar is going to depend on both the type of bond and the shape of the molecule. So water is a polar molecule because it has polar bonds and because it has a bent shape. And because 
Both of these dipoles are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction, you get an overall dipole. And if your molecule has an overall dipole, that means the molecule is polar. On the other hand, BeCl2 has two dipoles. Chlorine is more electronegative than beryllium. Chlorine's electronegativity is three. Beryllium's electronegativity is 1.5. On this table, unfortunately, the decimal points are hard to see. Just know that electronegativity values range from zero to four. So therefore, all of these numbers on these tables are less than four. They're either four or less. So there is a decimal in each of these values on this table. It's just hard to see the decimals. This is not a good copy of this table, unfortunately. I'm going to try to produce a better copy of it and post it in eLearn under the Chapter 5 um, Notes and Classwork section. And so BeCl2 has two equal dipoles for the BeCl bond, chlorine being more electronegative. The arrow of the dipole points towards the chlorines. These dipoles are equal in magnitude, They are the same type of dipole. They're both BeCl dipoles, but they're going in opposite directions. So they cancel each other out. And so therefore that makes BeCl2 nonpolar. Whereas with the OH dipoles in water, these dipoles are also equal in magnitude. And going in the same direction. So they do not offset or cancel each other out. They add to each other and give you an overall dipole. And that makes water polar. So for this set of questions, we have a pair of bonds given and we need to determine which one is more polar. And whichever one is more polar, we need to determine the pair of electrons is more strongly attracted to which one of the atoms. In other words, which atom is more electronegative? So if we compare HF and HCl, for HF, the difference in electronegativity, fluorine's electronegativity is four, Hydrogens is 2.1, so that delta En is 4 minus 2.1, which gives you 1.9. For HCl, chlorine's electronegativity is 3. And of course, again, hydrogen is 2.1, so therefore the delta En is 3 minus 2.1, which gives you 0 0.9. So HF is more polar. So whichever one gives you the greatest difference in electronegativity, that's going to be the more polar bond. 
And then looking at HF, we can draw the dipole. With the arrow pointing toward the fluorine, because the fluorine is the greater elect has the greater electronegativity compared to hydrogen. So the electrons are more strongly attracted to the fluorine. So the electrons are more attracted to the fluorine versus the hydrogen. So going on to the second set of bonds, you have NH compared to OH. So we'll write down our electronegativities by just looking at our table. Nitrogen's electronegativity is three. Oxygen's electronegativity, I do believe, is 3.5. And again, hydrogen is 2.1. So for NH, the delta EN is 3 minus 2.1. For OH, the difference in electronegativity is 3.5 minus 2.1. So therefore, OH is more polar than NH. And then if I draw the OH bond and my dipole, the tip of the arrow will point towards the more electronegative oxygen atom, meaning that the electrons are more attracted to the oxygen. Next, comparing NO and OS. So for NO, the delta EN, oxygen's electronegativity is 3.5, nitrogen is 3.0, giving you a delta EN of 0.5. And now looking at OS, Sulfur's electronegativity is 2.5. So therefore for OS, the delta EN is 3.5 electronegativity for oxygen minus 2.5. For sulfur, that gives you one. So therefore, OS is more polar than NO. So with OS being more polar than NO, if I draw the OS bond 
and draw my dipole, my arrow will point towards the oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative than the sulfur. So therefore the electrons are more attracted to the oxygen. So the electrons are more attracted to the oxygen versus the sulfur. And then finally, HH versus CLC. Well, with hydrogens, the, both of them are the same electronegativity. They both have an electronegativity of 2.1. So the delta EN is 2.1 minus 2.1, which is zero. And then for CLC, Chlorine has an electronegativity of three. Carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5. So for CCL, the delta EN is 3.0 minus 2.5, which is 0.5. So therefore, CLC is more polar. So we draw the CLC bond and the dipole. The arrow points toward the chlorine because chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. So that means that the electrons are more attracted to chlorine. And so for question two, now that we've look, taken a look at in question one, how to decide whether or not a bond is polar and therefore which bond is more polar. And we know that if a bond is gonna be a polar covalent bond, its difference in electronegativity has to be between 0.4 and 1.8. And if it's less than 0.4, then it's a nonpolar covalent bond, which we also call pure covalent. In order for a molecule to be polar, that's what we've got to decide for question two. Number one, it has to have a polar bond. And the dipoles can't cancel each other out, so you've got to have an overall dipole. And then also the shape is also going to be an influence, not just whether or not you've got polar bonds and therefore an overall dipole. So if we look at CO2, and we've drawn this Lewis structure many times, we have two carbon-oxygen double bonds. Carbon's electronegativity is 2.5. Oxygen's electronegativity is 3.5. So the delta EN is 3.5 minus 2.5, which is 1. So we know that we've got a polar covalent bond. So carbon dioxide has two polar covalent bonds. 
with oxygen being the more electronegative atom. So the electrons are therefore more attracted to the oxygen versus the carbon. And these two dipoles are the same magnitude but opposite directions. So they cancel each other out. So you get no overall dipole. And what that what that means is that you've got a nonpolar molecule. Next we have COS. This is one that we haven't seen before, I don't believe. Carbon is in group four. Oxygen is in group six, and sulfur is also in group six. So that's 12 plus four gives us 16 valence electrons. Carbon will be the central atom. It's less electronegative than oxygen and sulfur. And counting my electrons that I've put in, I've put in too many. I've put in 20. So I need to remove those two and then remove two from either the oxygen or the sulfur. We'll do the oxygen, it doesn't matter which one. And then replace the electrons we took away with another single bond between the oxygen and the carbon, giving us a double bond. Now we do another count 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. We still have too many. And so we'll remove a pair of electrons from the sulfur and then the other lone pair on the carbon and replace those that we took away with another single bond between the carbon and the sulfur and therefore producing a double bond. Now we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So wow, COS looks a heck of a lot like CO2. As far as its geometry. This is also linear in its molecular geometry. And so we draw our two dipoles. Now let's analyze the two dipoles. These two dipoles, the C double bond O dipole is not the same as the C double bond S dipole because S and O are not the same atom. So you got two different types of dipoles. So dipoles are different in magnitude. And opposite in direction. So they do not overall cancel each other out. So you do get an overall dipole. So therefore you got a polar molecule. So even though COO and COS have the same molecular geometry linear, 
one of them is nonpolar, and the other is polar because they're dipoles. The dipole, the two dipoles in COS are not the same magnitude, whereas the two dipoles in CO2 are of the same magnitude. In both molecules, the dipoles move in opposite directions, but only the two dipoles for CO2 will cancel each other out because they are the same magnitude. Next, we've got SO2. So for SO2, we've got 18 valence electrons. And I've drawn in 20 electrons, so I've got too many. So I need to remove a lone pair from one of the oxygens and the central sulfur and replace those electrons that I took away with another single bond between the sulfur and that oxygen, giving us a double bond. So now we have our correct Lewis structure. With 18 valence electrons, with all atoms happy, with an octet of electrons around them. And so now we see that we can also have resonance structures. The double bond could be between the other oxygen and the central sulfur. And so that gives us a resonance hybrid. Where you have these one and a half bond strength bonds where that electron distribution can be distributed evenly between these two bonds. So there's our hybrid. And so we draw our two dipoles. And also the geometry of SO2. We go back and look at the total number of electron groups around the central sulfur. You've got three total, one being a lone pair. There's three one situation trigonal planar with molecular geometry that's bent, just like water. And so if we draw it properly with the bent geometry, I'm sorry, I had water on my mind. And then we draw our dipoles. 
to be exact. These dipoles are not exactly the same. Because one of the oxygens. Is going to have three pairs of electrons around it. This other oxygen only has two. And so therefore the bent geometry and the fact that you have a resonance hybrid with one SO bond being an SO single bond and one SO bond being an SO double bond, that's going to make these two different, these two bonds different between the sulfur and each of the individual oxygens. And that will give you different dipoles because one is going to be an SO single bond, one an SO double bond. And of course, it, you can draw resonance structures so you get a resonance hybrid. So therefore the dipoles are not different. And so again, you got dipoles of different magnitude moving in opposite directions that do not cancel each other out. And that gives us a polar molecule. And then the last one is actually in a monoatomic ion because you got three iodines. They're the same at type of atom. So we call these mono. I guess we could consider this a monoatomic or we could still consider it a polyatomic because it's more than one. It is more than one iodine. So it's a polyatomic ion. Three iodines. Each in group seven. And then you got a minus one charge. You got to add one electron for that minus one charge. So a total of 22 valence electrons. So the central iodine actually has three sets of lone pairs around it. So analyzing this central atom, you've got one, two, three, four, five groups of electrons around it. So if we do a Google search, and let's find a more extensive electron and molecular geometry table, this is a good one. And so we have five total groups, three of them being lone pairs. So our geometry is linear. So we're here at five. The very last row that you see on this table that I'm showing on this table, you got a total number of groups of five. Three of them are lone pairs. So that puts us into the linear molecular geometry. <laughs> 
So again, five total groups, one, two, three, four, five. Three of the five are lone pairs. So that gives us a linear molecular geometry. And so when we're analyzing the polarity of this one, And because this is an ion, when we draw its Lewis structure, we put it in brackets and put the charge outside of the brackets. And so therefore, because of this charge alone, we're going to have an overall dipole due to it being an ion with a negative charge. So that's going to make this molecule itself also polar. And so we talked about the difference between a polar covalent bond that has a difference in electronegativity between 0 0.4 and 1.8 and a nonpolar covalent bond having a difference in electronegativity that's less than 0 0.4. So now we want to talk about a specific type of polar covalent bond, and that is a hydrogen bond. So this is a special type of polar covalent bond. And for the hydrogen bond, you have a hydrogen atom that's bonded to either a nitrogen, an oxygen, or fluorine. And it's uh, more so what we call an electrostatic attraction between a hydrogen and a nitrogen, a hydrogen and an oxygen, or a hydrogen and a fluorine. And so what that means is that a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine in one molecule is attracted to a hydrogen atom in another molecule. And so a hydrogen bond is also called a type of dipole dipole interaction and so the hydrogen atom of one molecule will be attracted to either a nitrogen oxygen or a fluorine atom of a neighboring molecule and that sets up dipoles between these two molecules and therefore an electrostatic attraction of positive being attracted to negative, opposites attracting. Hydrogen is less electronegative than nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So the hydrogen carries the partial positive charge the nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine atoms carry the partial negative charge. So for example, if we have a sample of water, there are hydrogen bonds 
in that sample of water because the water molecules are attracted to each other. The hydrogen of one water molecule will be attracted to the oxygen atom of a neighboring molecule. Those red dashed lines indicate these electrostatic attractions, which we call a hydrogen bond. And so hydrogen bonds are intermolecular bonds, whereas covalent bonds, both polar and nonpolar, covalent bonds, they happen within a molecule. So they are called intramolecular bonds. Hydrogen bonds occur between molecules and therefore they're called intermolecular bonds. So just think of intermolecular bonds like an interstate highway. An interstate highway uh, goes from one state to another state to another state. And so intermolecular bonds are attractions between molecules, whereas intramolecular bonds happen within one single molecule. So hydrogen bonds take are these electrostatic attractions that occur between two molecules, being that the hydrogen of one molecule is attracted to either a nitrogen, oxygen, or a fluorine atom in another molecule. Hydrogen bonds are not as strong as covalent bonds, but they are strong enough to affect the physical properties of the substance. The high boiling point of water that we talked about earlier, for example, it's due to hydrogen bonds. And in order to get water to boil, you've got to break up all of these hydrogen bonding interactions that take place between water molecules. And until you break away those hydrogen bonding attractions, the water will remain in liquid state. Now, these bonds shown in blue in this picture within each water molecule, these are covalent bonds, and in particular, polar covalent bonds. But the red dashes are the hydrogen bonds. So the chemical changes are governed by the strengths of the intramolecular forces, the covalent, which we can call nonpolar covalent and the polar covalent bonds. Physical changes are governed by the strengths of the intermolecular forces like hydrogen bonds and other intermolecular forces and bonds like London dispersion forces. So why does ice float? It's also due to hydrogen bonding. Due to hydrogen bonding, it makes the structure of ice very porous or having these little spaces between the molecules. So this causes a lower density for solid water versus liquid. So ice has a lower density than liquid water. So therefore, solid water, ice, will float on top of liquid water, and this is a good thing for aquatic plants and fish that live in fresh water, they can still survive in the wintertime by residing in the deeper parts of the body of water because below the ice on the top surface of the lake, there's liquid water. The ice will always float on top of the liquid water. So this is a picture of the hydrogen bonding lattice structure of ice, which is less dense than water. And so you have to put in energy to break the hydrogen bonds in order to take the water from a liquid to a gas. Some other special things about water other than having a high boiling point. It has a high specific heat of 1.00 calories per gram degree Celsius. 
which is also equivalent to 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. Water has a heat of fusion, and this heat gets released when liquid water freezes to a solid. So that's why crops are sprayed with water to prevent freezing. Heat of vaporization of water. Heat gets released when gas condenses to a liquid. So this is condensation. And then the opposite, when liquid gets converted to a gas, this is vaporization or evaporation. So you have what's called a delta H of vaporization. And this delta equals change. So the change in heat or the change in energy. Due to vaporization. And here condensation is the opposite of vaporization. So this will represent a negative delta H of vaporization, meaning that heat gets released when a gas condenses to a liquid. Same thing here for fusion. Delta H of fusion, when you have liquid freezing into a solid, you get a negative delta H of fusion. The opposite process when you have a solid melting to form a liquid, you get a positive delta H of fusion. So taking a look at these questions, we've got two water molecules. And here you see the red dots. That's your hydrogen bond. It is an intermolecular force that happens between two water molecules. Question two, illustrate hydrogen bonding in four molecules of ammonia, NH3, and is ammonia polar? So ammonia, NH3, and we need to draw four of them. And so illustrate hydrogen bonding 
between these four water molecules. And we'll show our hydrogen bonds as dashed lines. So the hydrogen of one ammonia is going to be attracted to the nitrogen of another ammonia. And so that's a pretty good uh, representation of at least three hydrogen bonds between neighboring ammonia molecules. Of course, nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And so you have attraction between a partial negative charge on the nitrogen and a partial positive charge on a hydrogen. So the red dashes rep represents the hydrogen bond. And of course, ammonia is polar. So if we draw another ammonia over here, we draw the three dipoles. Nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So your three dipoles are the same magnitude and going in same direction. So therefore, ammonia is a polar molecule. In question three, are covalent bonds broken when water boils? Are hydrogen bonds broken when water boils? Illustrate with the drawing. So for the first question, covalent bonds are these guys here. So covalent bonds are not broken when water boils. Covalent bonds are broken I'm sorry. Hydrogen bonds are broken when water boils. 
And so again, if we have some water molecules, So you've got your hydrogen bonds. And then you boil the water. What you're gonna have now are water molecules that are in gas form. And they're spread out far apart from each other now, not touching. And it's the hydrogen bonds that cause the liquid water molecules to be close together and therefore touching each other slightly. So with liquid, little kinetic energy, water molecules are touching. So they're close to each other due to the hydrogen bonds. And then over here in the gas phase, the water molecules are spread far apart. they are not touching, and therefore you have kinetic energy. The water molecules in gas phase can now move freely. They have complete freedom of movement. And so notice that the polar covalent bond, the co polar covalent bonds within the water molecules never get broken. It's the hydrogen bonds, the red dashes, that do get broken. And so the rest of this chapter five, part one note packet talks about where water is, the difference between potable, safe drinking water, and that that is non-potable, that is not safe for drinking, meaning it has contaminants. So if you're ever in a chemistry lab, you should never turn on the faucet and fill your water bottle back up using that water in a chemistry lab. Water in a place like a chemistry lab is called non-potable, not safe for drinking. It can contain chemical contaminants that somebody may have poured into the piping system, could contain bacteria, so on and so forth. So fresh water makes up only 3% of all the water found on Earth. Most of that fresh water can be found in glaciers and ice caps and in snow fields. Another 30% of fresh water is found underground. And then only 0.3% of fresh water is on the surface in lakes, rivers, and wetlands. And then the next part talks about water use trends. Which parts of our day-to-day -day lives do we use the most water for? Uh, things like uh, irrigation and thermoelectric power, those uh, types of processes use the most water. Agriculture accounts for about 30% of the global water consumption. So your water footprint is an estimate of the volume of fresh water that is used for a specific purpose. And so water footprints for meat and grains is a very high footprint. That's how much water is used for one kilogram of chicken, pork, beef, and sheep production. 
just to produce one kilogram of that type of meat. These are the various numbers of liters of water that's needed just for one kilogram of beef. I love hamburgers, I love steak. So to produce one kilogram of beef, it takes 15,400 liters of water. Then here's a table that shows you the water footprints for various types of uh, food products and other consumer products like one cotton t-shirt needs about 2,500 liters of water to produce it. So the average American uses about 100 gallons of water a day. And much of our water that we use every day comes from underground aquifers, which are very, very short in supply and number in our country. And so our aquifer water is usually normally free of pollutants, but there are instances where this water becomes polluted due to certain activities such as mining, fertilizers, chemicals that are, are pro processed in chemical plants, as well as the chemicals that we pour down the sinks in our own homes can sometimes contaminate our water supply. And so this is very important to make sure that our aquifers, where we get all of our daily water use for our homes and for our drinking, that it doesn't become contaminated. And that brings us to the end of part one of the chapter five pre-lecture recording.